Hey, thank you for joining us this morning at Cornerstone Rockwall Church. We are so excited about what God is doing in and among our church family. And so now we are getting ready to jump into his word. And our hope and our prayer is that you would experience and grow in your understanding of the love that God has for you and the work that he has done and continues to do in Jesus. So let's jump into the word together. Morning, Cornerstone. How you guys doing? I think if we take nothing else away from today, you guys turn me down a little bit. It's a little bit hot. Um, if we can take nothing else away from today, it's that we need to full send for the Lord. Did I do that? Did I say it right? Does that feel? Yeah, it feels weird from me. Um, so, so I got to remember where I'm at in life. Anyways, my name is Dustin. I'm one of the pastors here. It's so glad to have you guys here. And we are, um, we're, we're continuing in our series called Unshakable. And we're actually finishing off 1 Thessalonians uh, today. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 to 28. So we're going to finish off Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And as we get started and as you turn there in your apps and stuff, um, I was looking through some, some statistics because um, that's what I do in my spare time. Um, is I like reading stats. Uh, and um, I was reading a Gallup poll. Uh, you know, Gallup every year does kind of conversations where they'll, they'll uh, poll people about their thoughts on the church, their view of the church. And, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2021, 30, only 37% of Americans would say that they have confidence in the church. 37% of Americans. That is extremely low. It's actually the second lowest that it's ever been since they started polling. Um, in 2001, by comparison, it was 60%. So in 20 years, people's, the America, people in America, as the poll is Americans, their trust and confidence in the church has dropped almost in half. That's crazy when you think about it. That's, it to me, it's shocking. Um, because I've been in and around church for a long time. Um, I didn't grow up in the church, but I came, became a believer in high school. Um, and so I've been in and around churches, and I've been in a lot of like, relatively healthy church environments and experienced really good growth and encouragement. And um, There's always drama, but, but generally speaking, I would say it was a healthy church. But it's interesting to see that in, in our culture now and in the world that the church isn't seen in the same way. And there isn't the same trust in leadership. There isn't the same trust in the institution of church. People are far more guarded. And, and for some of it, probably for good reasons, right? Like we all know the stories. We've all seen the stories of what's gone on in the life of the church. Big C church. We've seen leaders fall. We've seen messes and brokenness and hurts. And, you know, Cornerstone's gone through its fair share as well. Right? We, we as a church have gone through hard seasons and we've gone through painful things and Everything from leadership failures and just messiness, right? This messiness, sinfulness, brokenness that has had an impact. And there's some of you in this room who are carrying the scars of that. Just many people I know who are carrying the weight and the scars of some of the woundedness that's happened and just experiencing the fact that the church is full of flawed people and messy things happen and happen at all levels of church life. And even today, like we continue, I mean, in some ways, we just continue to feel the ripple effects, uh, more transitions and more challenges and hard things. And in it, so we, we, the series is called Unshakable. But I'll be honest, like I think, and I think we could all resonate with this, whether you're, you've been part of Cornerstone for a long time or maybe you're new to the church or you've come from another church, like the church feels very shaken in a lot of ways. Like it feels like we've gone through a lot. And some of that is self-inflicted, for sure. And some of it's a result of culture. But, but I think the other question, the question we want to ask ourselves is, how, how do we become unshakable? What does it mean to be an unshakable church? In the elder room, your elders and pastoral team have been, for months now, been wrestling through 
um, just how do we move forward as a church? How do we become, in essence, unshakable? And some of the questions that we've batted around a lot in that room is, um, you know, how do we continue to foster a healthy church and leadership culture, right? How do we protect the, the problems that have happened in the past? How do we protect from that happening again? How do we create um, a healthy environment, a biblical environment for, for leadership, for staff, for, for the congregation, that someplace where it feels um, steadfast and stable and, and, and where we can, we can know, know in air quotes, but, but know that we're, we're, we're seeking the Lord in all things and, and that Cornerstone is a safe place in an unshakable church. You know, we also have talked about how, um, like, what is God wanting to do in and through Cornerstone going forward? I mean, for those of you who know the story, like, there, there's no reason that Cornerstone should be here today in what the last couple of years have been, what the church has gone through. And it's through the faithfulness of a couple very key people, many of you sitting in here, right, who have, who have weathered the storm and fought for the church. Leadership, congregation, people who have, have dug their heels and said, we're going to love and serve this church because we believe that God wants to do something. And so if God has preserved the church, then we have to assume it's for a reason, right, that he still has things he wants to do in and through us. And so in the, in the elder and pastoral room, we've been talking a lot about that. Like, how, like, what is it God's wanting to do? How do we make sure that we're in alignment with him, that we're not running ahead of him, we're not falling behind him, but that we're seeking him in all things and we're, we're moving forward as a church? In essence, how do we become unshakable? How can we set up our, ourselves and pursue the Lord in such a way that um, we're able to withstand the challenges and the changes that are frankly inevitable? Change happens. Hard times happen. There's no way to avoid that. But how can we make sure that we're doing what we can as a leadership culture and as a church family to be as unshakable as we can be? And the church is a people, right? The church, Lawrence just mentioned that. The church isn't a building that you go to. It's a people. It's a gathered people, people who gather in the name of Jesus. And so how do we become unshakable people so that we are an unshakable church, so that we can live out the gospel in our community? So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today, and this is kind of where Paul lands his letter to the Thessalonians. And if you've been with us, you know that even over the last two weeks, we've, we've kind of packed, unpacked this idea of an unshakable hope, right? That, that Paul reminds us both, 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 both personally and corporately that we have this unshakable hope, uh, hope in Jesus, that, that, that the Lord himself, Jesus himself, will come back, that he will make all the wrongs right, that he will wipe away every tear from every eye. And that ultimately, all the injustice and all the hurt and all the pain, he will right it. Justice and peace will rule and reign. That's so much of what we saw in chapter 4 and 5. But then at the end, when Scott shared last week, right, he said, like, but as we wait, you're not in darkness, so live as light. Right? As we wait for Jesus to return, as we wait for, for things to be made right, live as if the day, that day is here now. Live in the light. Live as a light. Paul says, be awake and sober-minded. Like, be, be ready. Be engaged. Be focused. Full send. And in verse 11 in chapter 5, what we landed last week was, Paul says, encourage one another and build each other up as you are doing. So Paul's saying, like, hey, what you guys are always already doing, like how you're loving and serving and caring for each other, like, keep going. Keep pushing into it. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep moving forward. And that leads us to where we're going to be today. So I'm going to read it, and then we'll pray, and we'll, we'll unpack some things. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting at verse 12. Paul says this, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disrupted. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. 
Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let's pray together. Father, we, um, we come to you as a church that, that wants to be who you've designed us to be and who, you've de- who you desire us to be. And that's not going to be about how cool our songs are, or how nice our building is, or how comfy our chairs are, or how good our coffee is. Like, those things aren't bad, but they are not the centerpiece of how we live as an unshakable church, how we become an unshakable people in the midst of a very shaken world. So Lord, we ask you now, we, we beg you, Lord, come and teach us. Teach our hearts. Give us ears to hear and minds and hearts to embrace truth from your word. And then help us to assimilate and integrate this into every part of our lives so that we could be the people you've called us to be, so that we could be the light. And so many would come to know you and follow you. We thank you in your son's name. Amen. So we're going to unpack three things. I mean, there's probably, there's a ton more, but we're going to look at like three basic things that Paul kind of focuses on in this passage um, that would help us to know what it means to be an unshakable church. And so it's three things that he encourages the Thessalonian church that I think we can pull from. And so for first thing is this, that an unshakable church values the hard work of flawed leaders. The unshakable church values the hard work of flawed leaders. So look back at verses 12 and 13. Paul says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work, and live at peace with each other. So look, at, like every, every leader in church history, every leader who has ever existed, who has ever breathed breath except for Jesus, is a flawed leader. Every one of them. If you think about it, the Bible is actually a book of God working in spite of very flawed, very broken people. That's the Bible. And so we have to start by acknowledging that, like, that, that, that every leader is going to have their struggles. Every, every team of leaders, every elder, every pastor, they're, they're human, they're imperfect. But what Paul encourages here in verses 12, 13, 13 to the church, he says, hey, like, acknowledge or honor, see the value in those who work hard among you. And he specifically pointed it at leaders. And it it is true, like scripture talks a lot in other passages about what it means to be a leader, to walk in the way of Jesus. And what you see is, is, is is a leader who would sacrifice themselves. A leader who lifts others up, doesn't lead from the top down, doesn't lord it over the people. But he who wants to be the greatest becomes the servant of all, right? That's, that's the model that Jesus said is what Jesus taught, and it's how Jesus lived. And so absolutely, like, there's a reality that leaders need to take responsibility for that. And leaders in the church need to own that that is their role as a leader. That leadership in its essence is servanthood and sacrifice. And what Paul encourages the church here is he says, hey, no, see the value of, and don't take for granted what? Three things, those who work hard. The word there in the Greek is this idea of toil, sacrifice. Those who, who work hard among you, who sacrifice, who suffer for you. Those who too care for you. And that word kind of is this idea of both guidance and governing, right? And so it's this idea of a care, caregiver and a leader at the same time. There's, there's this reality, it's like the, the, those who, who, um, who work hard among you, those who care for you. And then the third one is those who admonish you. And literally just means those who put sense in you. Because all of us struggle with being senseless at times. And we all need people who would come alongside us. We need leaders in our life. People are going to come in and go, hey, wait a minute. Like, does that align with Scripture? Like, are you believing truth or are you believing lies? Are you, are you walking in alignment with Jesus or are you walking out of alignment with Jesus? Are you seeing your, your life and your faith in, in a way that would honor and, and f- trust the Lord? Or are you kind of seeing it through your own lens? Even like what with the, the, um, Ben and Jill shared. Like, right? like I, I, just, I wanted faith on my own terms. Right? Like I wanted to do my own thing. But I'm realizing that, that, it, that, that like I have a responsibility as a follower of Jesus to, I don't know, actually follow Jesus. And we need people in our lives. 
You need people standing on this platform. You need people in your small group. You need leaders in your life, people around you who are going, wait a minute. Like, are you following him? Are you seeking him with your whole heart? Are you chasing after him? Are you giving him all of who you are? Pushing and correcting at times and warning one another. Look, you should have tension at times with what you hear up here. You should leave at times going like, I don't know if that's me. I don't know. I don't know if I'm living that out. You should open your Bible and you should read it. And at times you should be like, what I see here of these followers of Jesus and how I live my life doesn't seem the same. You should have times in your small groups, in your AC groups, when when you feel that, when you feel like, ah, I don't think I'm in alignment. You need people who are challenging and encouraging and correcting you. And Paul's saying, hey, acknowledge them. And he goes even further in the first verse 13, right? He says, hold them in the highest regard in love. And the highest is mean like hold them far above, super above, beyond, like just like value them. Like really, really value them. Value the words they say. Value them, support them. That doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with every decision they make. That doesn't mean that you don't challenge and ask questions, right? So it's not this idea of blind faith where I'm like, well, I just hope it works out. Like, who knows what that guy's up to? But there's a sense of honor. And he says, do it in love, right? And so this idea, this agape, that's the Greek word, right? This committed love that, hey, like I value these people. I value these people who are working hard, who are sacrificing, who are giving themselves to help lead us and lead our church. And so I want to honor them. I want to I hold them at the highest regard. I want to be committed to holding them there. And then end of verse 13, he says, and live at peace with each other. Which kind of shows a couple of things. One, really, what, in essence, what Paul's saying is like, work through your challenges. One of the best ways that you can honor leaders is to work through your stuff with other people. Like when you have conflict with someone in the church, go to them. I don't know, actually take Jesus' words in Matthew seriously. And if there's conflict, go talk to someone. Say, hey, man, I don't feel like we're not good. Like, hey, that hurt me. We need to talk about it. That's a way to value your leaders instead of going, well, do you know what he said? And you know what she said? You know what they did? Like, actually go to people, right? Also, living at peace means that when you're out of alignment or when you have conflict with leaders, you talk to them. You go to your elders and you say, hey, you guys have been making these decisions and I, like, I don't get it. Like, maybe there's data I don't have or maybe you guys are all crazy. Like, I don't know what it is. Help me understand. And there's an honorable way to do that, and we've seen that in the last you know, year or so. I've seen a fair amount of people who have said, like, hey, I got questions. I need answers. There's also a dishonorable way, in a way, and a not an unloving way to do that, and fortunately, we've seen that as well. And so it's not about just kind of like shutting it off and hoping everything works out, but it's, tr- it's really, really, frankly, it's about trusting the Lord. Lord, this is your church. This isn't my church. This, this is, these are your people. This is your city. This is your world. You want to do things here. It's not about any one leader. It's not about me. It's not about any of that stuff. And so, Lord, I want to, I want to make sure that the people that you have put in place, that we honor them, that we encourage them, that we challenge them, but we do it in love. We don't assume the worst. Those are the things that happen out of scars from past experiences, right? 36% of people trust the church right now in America, right? There's wounds. And those wounds kind of pack up and back up, and then it causes us to be like, ah. You know, in, a, in the absence of information, our tendency isn't to believe the best case scenario about people. And that's in leadership. That's in everything. So when you don't have all the data, our tendency isn't to go like, I'm sure they're totally like cruising. Like this is, this is probably the best thing ever. Like, that's not our tendency. Our tendency is to be like, something shady is going on right now, right? That's what our hearts run to. And again, like I said at the beginning, some of that is well-founded. 
Because shady things have gone on. And shady things will at times continue to go on because people are flawed and broken. But there is a way that we can live as Paul called us to. We can be unshakable by valuing the work of the leaders and investing in encouraging and challenging and and holding them at the highest regard and love. And learning to live at peace with one another. Working towards clarity and unity both with one another and with our leadership. And not kind of doing the little sideways talk and like behind the scenes and innuendo. But if we have a conviction or we have a concern, we go to someone. We ask them, hey, I heard you say this. Like, explain that because that sounded wrong. An unshakable church will value its leaders, honor them, knowing that every leader is flawed. It's actually why plurality is so important in the church. You don't want a church centered on one person. You don't want a church built on one personality. Because that one person is not perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. And so we need need multiple leaders. We need multiple people caring for and balancing and encouraging, walking closely with one another. And it is both the responsibility of the leader and it's the responsibility of us as a church. Like leaders need to live with honor. There's a clear call all throughout scripture. And the church needs to honor its leaders. It's always both and. It's never either or. An unshakable church values the hard work of flawed leaders. Let's look at the second one. Verses 14 and 15. An unshakable church is committed to loving and serving others. The unshakable church is committed to loving and serving others. And so if Paul takes those first couple verses and he kind of focuses, hey, church, like this is your disposition or your heart towards leadership. Now he kind of shifts and goes like, hey, church, this is your disposition towards one another. This is your disposition towards the church itself, the other people within the church, and the community and the culture around you. And he says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. So you can see how he shifted. And he's basically said, like, hey, church, like, yeah, honor your leaders, and you have responsibility in this too. Like, the church is not a consumer product. Unfortunately, we've made it one in many ways. We come in, we get what we want, we check a box, and we go about our day. It's not how the church is designed to exist. The church is designed to be a people, a body of believers who were inexplicably tied together by the person and the work of Jesus and invested in one another and invested in loving and caring for and serving one another and leading one another and challenging one another. And that's exactly what Paul's getting to here. He says first in verse 14, warn those who are idle and disruptive. The word in the Greek is just disorderly. And so you see both sides of it, right? Idleness is disorderly and being disruptive is disorderly. And so people in the church who are, who are just either super lazy and not engaged and those who are wreaking havoc and making a mess, right? He says, hey, warn them. Those who are disruptive to the church, to the life of the church, to the work of the gospel, like you gotta warn them. You, gotta, you can't just let people run amok. Like, if you, people you have relationship with who are messy and making a mess and, and causing problems, you have to be like, hey, man, like, can we have coffee? I'll buy. Like, we need to talk. Like, we need that. Like, that's part, that's not just the responsibility of the leaders, it's the responsibility of the whole church to protect the church. And then he goes from there, he says, in, in 14, uh, second half of 14, he says, encourage the disheartened. And that word is this idea of those who are easily shaken or timid. And, and we all know people like this, and some of you probably are, some of us are those people, right, who... Who like, as soon as anything goes sideways, a little bit, they're like, ah! Right? So it's sensitive hearts, the tender-hearted people. People are so easily thrown around or moved around or destabilized. Paul says, hey, encourage them. Like, comfort them, support them, remind them of the gospel, remind them of Jesus' love for them, remind them that it's his church and not, that, 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 that God is on his throne, remind them that the day will one day come when all wrongs will be made right. Like, encourage them. He continues on and says, help the weak. And that word is this idea, of, he said, it literally just means hold on to. Hold on to those who are weak. 
And weakness can be physical, it could be emotional, it could be any, any of those things. But he's basically saying, he's like, hey, I want you to, like those who are in your church family who are weak, who are struggling physically, emotionally, relationally, grab onto them. Hold tight. Don't let them slip away. Don't let them fall away. And again, who's he talking to? The church. It's not saying, hey, leaders, here's your job. Of course leaders have that part, part of that. That's part of our job. I got to spend time yesterday with someone in the hospital. It's awesome. I love doing that kind of stuff. But if it's only ever the pastors and leaders who do it, they're not a really loving church. And there's too much need and too much weakness and too much hurt to go around for four or five, six people to care for it all. So Paul's saying, hold on to them. Encourage them. Warn the ones who are idle. In the end of 14, he says, and be patient with everyone. I did check the Greek, and unfortunately, everyone does mean everyone. I was hopeful, like I really was. I'm like, okay, is there any caveats? Is there anyone that isn't in everyone that I cannot be patient with? But in essence, what Paul's saying is like, hey, be patient with the weak. Be patient with those who are idle. Be patient with those who are disheartened. Don't give up on people. Don't check out on them just because they don't move as fast as you want them to or they don't change as quickly as you'd hope they would or they don't align with your viewpoint or your ideas. Don't, don't give up on people. Be patient. Don't get frustrated. Don't dismiss them. But persevere. Stick through the relationships. Lean in in the challenging times. Don't block numbers of people who are hurting. We all have that, right? We all have those people that when their phone, their name comes up on your phone, you're like, oi, all right, like, do I have time for this, right? Like, we all, we all experience that. And Paul's challenging, he's saying, don't do that. Lean in, love, serve, commit, encourage, be patient. 15, he says, don't let, don't let, uh, let others pay back wrong for wrong. Instead, always strive to do what is good. So super clear, a retaliatory spirit where we want to punch back is not of the Lord. And some of us have that disposition, again, coming out of woundedness, right? Like once you get hurt once, you're like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And so many of us walk around relationally like this. Come on. (laughs) Like, I, I, need, I don't have any close friends. No one loves me. No one calls me. And then, but you're, we're literally walking around like this. And we have this retaliatory protective instinct in us. And he says, don't, don't let people do that. Don't, that's unloving, and it's not going to foster unity in relationship. But he says, instead, always strive to do what is good for each other and to everyone else. It's the opposite of paying back wrong for wrong. In essence, seek the good of everyone. Everyone you encounter, you should be saying, like, Lord, how do, I, how, do I, how do I serve them? How do I love them? How do I help them? Whether they're weak, timid, a pain in the rear, whatever it would be, wherever they're at, my heart's disposition as a follower of Jesus who is part of his body is to be like, okay, how can I serve them? Not what can I get out of them? Not how do they help me fill my needs and my wants and fix my problems? Not that. But coming to people and saying, like, like, okay, Lord, like, I, I want to be able to make an impact. I want to be able to love them and serve them. An unshakable church is committed to loving and serving others. We are others-centered. We're not focused on what we get from church. We're focused on what we have to offer as being the church, both in the church body and in our community and in our workplaces and in our schools. And in our families, it is an other-centered faith. It always has been. And no one modeled that more clearly than Jesus did. Who, though, was everything, Lord of lords, King of kings, laid himself down and gave everything up. Why? So that we could have this opportunity so that we can have a relationship with him, so that we can be empowered by his spirit, so that we could love and serve one another. 
Not of our own strength, not because we're amazing, but because of his love in us and through us. And the only way to really love and serve, the only way to be this church, an unshakable church that is committed to loving and serving others, is to actually be invested in the lives of people. You can't do it from a distance. You you can't do it like this. You have to get in the game. You have to love and serve the people. You have to build relationships. Any genuine relationship is always going to be messy and inefficient. We are so desperate for efficiency. We are so desperate to self-protect and self-preserve. You will never, let me be clear, you will never have biblical, genuine relationships without risk. It's not going to happen. You have to be willing to risk some of who you are in order to get in the lives of people and you risk getting hurt in order to experience them loving and serving you and to get the opportunity to love and serve them. That is the only way it works. And odds are, you're going to get hurt sometimes. You're going to. And yet one day Jesus will come and he will make all wrongs right. And though you may be hurt by someone that you thought was going to be a friend, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And he will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. And if that is true and you really believe it, then it's not that hard to risk. Then the idea of giving yourself to other people and being like, look, I don't need, like their friendship doesn't define me. Their love for me doesn't define me. Jesus' love for me defines me. And so I can freely give myself away. I can love and serve. And the more I pour myself out, the more he meets me in those spaces. The more sacrificial I am, the more generous I am, the more Jesus meets me, the more I experience his love, the more I experience his grace. Not because it's reciprocal with a person, although that's obviously what we want and what we need, but first and foremost because Jesus is in you. His spirit is moving through you. An unshakable church is going to be committed to loving and serving others. Thirdly, verses 16 through 22, an unshakable church follows Jesus passionately. An unshakable church will follow Jesus passionately. And so we saw like the first one, right? Paul's orientation with the church. He says, hey, here, here's your heart and your disposition towards your leadership. Second half or second part. Here, here's your heart and disp- disposition towards one another. This is what it means to be the church, to be the people of God. And the third one is really like, this part is really like, here's your heart and your disposition towards Jesus himself. This is your heart towards him and his leadership and guidance in your life. And he says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is God's will for you, just so you know, mental note, two-thirds of the times that you see the word you, Y-O-U in your Bible, it's plural. It's y'all. It's one of very few times I'll use that term. I'm not a yaller, not an indigenous Texan. But that word is a y'all, it's not a you. It's not about me. But he's saying, hey, God's will for y'all is to keep your heart and your eyes fixed on Jesus. And so how does he say to do that? One, rejoice always. A church will always become what it celebrates. It's part of why we had rants. I wanted, we wanted to have him share one of the students to share. If you want to see a culture change, I mean, this works in your family, this works in the church, this works anywhere. If you want to see the temperature change, celebrate. Celebrate the victories. Look, think about it. When you had a baby, it was a long time ago for me, thank the Lord. Um, I'm just, it's a new stage. But anyways, when your baby first starts to walk, right, and, and you kind of prop them up and they take a step and then they fall over. You're not like, oh, stupid baby. (laughs) No one does that. Right? What do we do? We're like, dude, you took a step. That was awesome. Okay, now let's try two, right? And then, you know, if you're a high achiever parent, you're like, no, we're going to walk across this floor before this afternoon's over. But anyways, but there's this point that, like, what you celebrate bakes into who you are. And so Paul says it, he says, rejoice always. A church will become what it celebrates. Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in who he is, rejoice in what he's doing. Even in the hardest times, right? We're talking about a church that suffered and struggled. 
And he's like, rejoice. And he says, pray continually, which that's just a beautiful picture of this ongoing surrender and dependence on the Lord. It's nothing will remind you you're not in control like prayer. So Lord, like, I, I need you. Like, I don't even want to rejoice today. I need your help to rejoice today. Hey, I don't know how to deal with these things. I, I don't know why my heart feels so cold. I, like, whatever it would be, but praying continuously, bringing everything. There is nothing that he doesn't want to hear from you because he's a good father and he loves to hear from his kids. Pray for everything. Bring it all into him. He says, give thanks in all circumstances. That's a really beautiful picture of contentment, right? Man, it's been such a hard month or such a tough time financially or such a a hard season in my marriage. And yet I, I know that the Lord's in it and I know that he's leading and guiding me. Contentment. That we would give thanks. Lord, thank you that even though things aren't good in these spaces, you're still good contentment, trust in him, trust that he's going to lead us and guide us. In verse 19, he says, do not quench the spirit and do not treat prophecies with contempt. Literally, it's uh, do not put out the spirit's fire and do not have disdain towards prophecies. I know there's a lot of debate about what New Testament prophecy is, right? Because we do see it, but we know it's not Old Testament prophecy, but like it isn't clearly defined. What does it mean? What is a New Testament prophecy? And so to, for me, that's not my biggest concern that we nuance all that out tonight or today, this morning. Jeez, what day is it? Where am I? Who are you? Sorry. <laughs> but here's what I can say is that we do know that God still to this day communicates to his people, right? Like we all would agree that God communicates to his people primarily, and this is what Paul will touch on through his word, that his word, his his completed, inerrant, infallible, trustworthy word is one of the primary ways he speaks to us. And it's actually the measuring stick that we hold to anything else that we're going to talk about. Like this thing is the primary way. But we also would say, like, if you follow Jesus for any length of time, that that he, he, he speaks to us by his spirit, right? That there's a sense that that, I, that God kind of pokes and prods and, and points things out to me and reveals sin to me. And, and I mean, I, it's not audible for me, but I, I do know. It's like, oh, I think, I think he's trying to tell me something, right? Like, so there's a sense that God speaks by his spirit as well. Now, again, as Paul will talk about, like this always governs it. And then the Lord does speak to us through others. Now, it's not a thus saith the Lord like the Old Testament prophets, because if that was the case, then all of us could just walk around with a rock just waiting for the wrong thing to be said, right? But there is a sense that, like, I'll I'll connect with a friend, and he'll be like, hey, man, like, let me just encourage you with this. Like, you were were sharing the story about your family, and I just, I don't know, man. Like, I just want to challenge you in that. Like, does that align with Scripture? Like, that's that's not apart from God. That's not like, wow, my friend's friend's just brilliant. Yeah, my friend is brilliant, probably, hopefully. But that's, that's not all it is. God is working in and through him right? The Lord is speaking and moving in and through us as a community as we speak and encourage and challenge one another. And so Paul's saying, hey, don't quench that. Don't put that fire out. And and don't have disdain or dismissiveness towards these words, whether his word, right? Like, so you think about it, through his word, some of the ways that we can be dismissive of it. Uh, Take James, for example, be a hearer. Don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer. How many of us have read or heard a message, or read something, and been like, yeah, no, not today. <laughs> that's, that's being dismissive. That's putting out the fire of God's word. How many of us get the sense from the Lord when he starts con- con- like kind of poking at sin issues, struggles, and he starts to kind of poke and prod, like, hey, you probably shouldn't have talked to your kids that way. And you're like, did you see what they did? Were you not paying attention? It's putting out the fire of the Spirit. It's being dismissive towards the Lord's voice. How many times have other people challenged us and encouraged us or pushed on something and we're like, well, yeah, I'll take it under advisement. I don't, I don't know. Right? Paul's saying, don't do that. But instead of, not, instead of doing that, test it. Hold it up. Think about the Bereans, right? Paul comes to the Bereans in Acts and he starts telling them and he's like, hey, like, this is the gospel. Like, Jesus is Messiah. He is Lord and Savior. And they're like, wait a minute. Isaiah, right? Let's start there. 
We want to we make sure that you're on the right track. That's how we should live. And he says, 21 and 22, hold on to what is good and then reject every kind of evil. You see what Paul's saying here? Like, hey, this is what it means to be a church community. That, that your disposition towards me, your disposition towards my word, your disposition towards how I speak to you, how I challenge you, how I want to shape you and mold you is don't dismiss it, don't push it aside, but test it, hold it up. And then when it's good and of the Lord and it aligns with Scripture and it aligns with the ethic of Jesus, then take that in fully and completely. If it's out of alignment, reject it. And that could be from some stuff coming to you from others. It also could be in your own head and your own heart. Look, no one lies to you more than you do because no one talks to you more than you do. You're in your head way more than anyone else ever will be. And so are you even filtering that? Are you taking every thought captive and submitting it to Christ? Are you asking yourself questions like, is this feelings or is this reality? Like, What's really going on here? This is what it means to follow Jesus passionately, to pursue him, to be like, Lord, I want to hear. I want to hear every word that you say. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss out on it. I want to have a heart that celebrates all of who you are in every circumstance. I want to, I want to pray. I want to be on my knees. I want to be going before you in all things, no matter how small or how big. If it's big enough to be stuck to my heart, it's big enough for me to talk to you about. Nothing is worth dismissing in that. And it, when, 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 when you speak, whether it's through your word or by your spirit or through others, like whenever that happens, Lord, I, I don't want to push it aside. I want to test it and I want to embrace it when it's true. This is what it means to follow Jesus passionately. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And this is what it looks like to become an unshakable church is that we all take that because God is at work. God is not silent. He is right now leading, encouraging, challenging us. He's got things he wants to see in us. He wants to remind you of his goodness and his grace and his mercy. All that's going on simultaneously. And so do we have ears that are ready to listen? Do we have a heart that's ready to, 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 to embrace? Are we rejoicing in him, praying continually for everything and content with all he's offering us? And are we committed to his word, listening to him, not quenching, but testing. And do we know truth well enough to actually test it? You'll never discern a lie if you don't know the truth. And if this is where truth is, and you never spend time in truth, how would you know? How would you know a speed limit if you don't see a speed limit sign? How would you know you're out of alignment if you don't know what in alignment looks like? Following Jesus passionately. If we want to become and be an unshakable church, we've got to follow Jesus passionately. And that's both personal, individual responsibility, and it's corporate, the whole church. Right, as we wrap it up, Paul kind of finishes the end of his greeting, verses 23 through 28. He says this, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all of God's people with a holy kiss. And then he talks about having the letter read to everybody and extends his grace. I love that he says, like, you know, brothers and sisters, pray for, you, pray for us and greet all God's people with a holy kiss. Not something we've held on to as a church culture, um, and not something that we've held on to post-COVID, right? But really, like, the heartbeat of this is, like, be um, warm and welcoming to one another. Be a family. Like, actually care about one another. Like, be hospitable towards one another. People should sense that you're for them and, when, and you're with them, even the introverts. But go back to 23. It says, may God himself, the God of peace, the God of shalom, May he do what? Sanctify you, which is the idea of making us holy, helping us to look more and more like Jesus, shaping our heart, our soul, our mind, right? And may your whole self be kept blameless. 
without fault. And, and this is the idea that like Jesus justified us, right? He died on the cross for our sins, so we are blameless. We are without fault. And then also, he is doing this thing where he is continually shaping and molding us and helping us to look more like him. So you are perfect in his eyes, and you are becoming perfect simultaneously. You are good. He doesn't look at you and keep a scorecard of all the dumb things you did this week. But he looks at those dumb things and goes, okay, but that's not in alignment with me. That's not what it means to be fully human. And so let me help you. Let me guide you. Let me encourage you. At the end of 24, he says, he who calls you, Jesus, right, who called you to himself, is faithful and he will do it. God is committed to the work that he is doing in you and in this church. And he is not done with you. And he's not done with Cornerstone. He is faithful. And he will do it. Okay, I mentioned earlier that the elders have been, the elders and pastoral team have been talking a lot, of asking, asking a lot of questions and wrestling through like this, this next season of Cornerstone, right? What does it look like? And you know, how do we foster and continue to foster a healthy church culture and, and, and protect the church from what has happened from happening again, right? And the band can start to come up. You guys can start to come up. I mean, and then also, like, what is he wanting to do? He has preserved us. So, like, Lord, like, what are you wanting to do? What does it mean for us to run with you and run for you in this season? And part of that, those conversations have, have been about, like, kind of defining our vision and values and clarifying some of who we are and where we're going. And um, in the last month or so, the elders have kind of reorganized and reoriented this. And um, you're going to get more details on this in the coming weeks, but I, they, they thought it was okay for me to share it with you. So the vision statement for Cornerstone, the new vision statement that have kind of been crafted out of a lot of like gathering together, did a full Saturday thing where we did a bunch of whiteboard stuff and asked a bunch of questions. But the, the, the vision statement is this. This is the new vision statement for Cornerstone. It says, our vision is to impact the world with the good news of Jesus by equipping the church to follow God passionately, love people authentically, serve others generously, and declare the gospel boldly. We try to keep it as simple as possible, but at the same time, be who the church is supposed to be. We, we, we want to impact the world with the good news of Jesus. Like We want the news of Jesus, the good news of Jesus' love and grace and mercy to extend out of these four walls and ripple out into our community and across the world. Like that's what we want. And the primary ways that that's going to happen is by equipping us, for all of us learning what it means to follow God passionately, to love people authentically, to serve generously, and to learn how to declare his good news boldly. So like I said, you're going to get more on that in the coming weeks, but just taking it at face value, imagine a church that was committed to Jesus in these ways. Imagine a church that took what Paul said in the book of 1 Thessalonians, everything we learned from chapter 1 all the way through to chapter 5. Imagine a church that actually took that seriously. A church that, that really did live to please the Lord. A church that, that really walked in obedience. A church that lived intentionally, anticipating his return. But, but didn't just look at that and go, well, one day I'll get to heaven. But it was like, no, like, I'm going to live today as if that day is now. Like, I'm going to live with a sense of urgency and commitment. A church that values, honors the work of the leaders that it has. A church that is committed to loving and serving others. And a church that, that follows Jesus with their whole heart, mind, and strength. Full send. Full send in how we live. That's an unshakable church. That's a church that can go through hard times. That can go through crises. And be steadfast on the other side. And that's the church we want to be. Why don't we bow our heads? I'm going to pray for us. But as I pray, I just actually, it's funny, I was talking with Chris uh, Gray, one of the elders, and we're, we were me messaging back and forth, and he said, like, hey, what's the, what's the takeaway? Like, what's the application for this Sunday? And I said, it's actually just more of an invitation. And so that's what this is. This is an invitation. Um, because again, Cornerstone is not a person. Cornerstone is not a leader. Cornerstone is a people. We are Cornerstone. And it takes all of us individually and corporately making that commitment to follow Jesus with our whole hearts and to love one another and to honor those that God has entrusted to our care. And it starts with each one of us. And so 
I just want to invite you to be a part of this. Look, we all have preferences. and like, Trust me, I've heard the conversations. I've heard the complaints. But God isn't done here. And we have an opportunity to continue to be his people. Through, the, through leaders like Bill and Scott and Chris and the other elders, like, God has preserved this church. And it was through their blood and their sweat and their tears and their pain and their struggle over the course of the last couple of years that Cornerstone is here and that we're sitting in this and that this building isn't owned by someone else. And yet there's so much more in front of us. We have a world around us. Just see if we're in Rockwall. We have a world around us here in Rockwall that desperately needs to know you, to know him. And we have an opportunity to be his, that light to shine it to the world around us. And so it's just an invitation to come be part of it with us, to lean in, to pursue him with your whole heart. And anything we can do as leaders and pastors to help you with that, we want to do that. Like, and we're not doing it perfectly and we've got areas to grow. We've got tons of areas to grow. But we want to be that. Jesus, thank you that it is your turn. Well, we hope this morning was an encouragement to you and if you'd like to learn more about our church family, you can go to our website at cornerstonerockwall.com. And there you can learn all about who we are and what we're about. Better yet, we would love to invite you to join us on a Sunday morning so that you really could experience our church family. So this week, we hope you are encouraged and challenged as you pursue Jesus in new and in fresh ways.